各位同仁、各位来宾，呃，很欢迎大家来到何副校长的 lecture。嗯、呃，何副校长的话，呃，我先介绍一下何副校长。何校长的话是，呃，现在是呃，新加坡国立大学的副校长，他的主要的业务就是 research and technology。他还有很多的 title， 譬如说他是呃 AI。dot sg 应该是 AI 的 initiative 的一个呃一个组织，然后他是 executive chairman， 他还是呃 Singapore Data Science Consortium 的 chairman， 嗯、呃，还有 director of 呃 SNU 的 Global Asia Institute， 还有 Center for Behavior Economics 也是在新加坡国立大学，而且他是嗯、呃、好几个呃学术期刊的呃。Editor， 呃，或在那个 editorial board， 其中一个就是 management science， 他是 management science 的呃、um, editor in chief。嗯、um, ，虽然何副校长的工作非常繁忙，不过他还是持续的 publish， 而且在 publish 在很顶尖的期刊，不用讲，就是他发表很多期呃很多的呃文章在 management science。而且有很嗯，他还发表了嗯文章在很顶尖的经济学的呃刊物，譬如说他有 GEB 的发表，有 Econometrica 的发表，嗯，还有 Jets 的发表 QJE。另外的话，他嗯最近的话也跨到其他的呃领域去，譬如说那个 Data Science 的话，他就。呃，副校长，呃，何副校长就发表在呃《Science》这个期刊，呃，而且呃还有一个文章发表在《Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences》，所以何副校长就嗯、呃、就非常 efficient， 不管是行政跟研究，都有很丰硕的呃呃成果。今天何副校长的话，他的所讲的题目是。Does big data solve big problems? 呃呃，副校长刚刚刚跟我讲说，这个是他嗯、呃、是要跟我们讲一下，就是分享一下嗯、呃、研究的呃啊怎么样去 ask the right question， 而且用什么呃 the the right approach 来 approach 这些问题。好，首先我们先啊、呃、来 give a back hand to 何副校长。其实啊，陈老师太不客气了哈，所以啊、呃，我其实啊，用、呃、普通话讲，普通话还是用英语比较好，因为很多很多那个那个那个名词我还不懂怎么翻译，不过你们可以问那个用普通话问题应该可以的。所以我先我先来讲，就是说这个这个其实我在啊、呃，我们在商学院里面做很多关于啊背景的东西，有些有些是一个营销学。因为行销学院很多时候在八十年代、九十年代的时候，有几间公司，你每当去那个那个 supermarket 买东西，他就给你 scan、scanning 啊，所以我那时候做了很多那些那些事情。啊、呃，我们不叫它 big data， 我们只叫它啊、呃、customer data。只是现在当然 big data 已经很 hot， 你不叫 big data， 其实我觉得有点有点有点 sad， 就是去搞一 big data， 那不用。Big data means big money, big right? So, okay, let me just go and tell you uh, two examples. Okay, let me just start with the presentation of this. Huh? So, I'm going to give you some quotation from all the famous people. Uh, data really power everything we do. We choose it because it, we deal with huge amount of data. Besides, it sounds really cool. Co-founder of Google. This I really like. So, actually, this is a very powerful data set. So, they will find extra byte. Extra byte. Extra byte is. 5 billion gigabyte, okay? Our information was created between the dawn of civilization to 2003. But that much information is being now created every two days. So, the data being created 5 billion gigabyte every single two days. It's all out there. And also, actually, uh, part this is this, the uh, uh, Indian chap, uh, Mukesh, uh, Ambani, which is a chamber of reliance industry, which is the largest IT company in uh, uh, India, he said now data is a new field of uh, 
of uh, the fourth, uh, fourth uh, industrial revolution. In fact, Alibaba uh, chairman uh, Jack Ma said the same thing. Uh, it's called DT. DT means data technology rather than digital tech. So data is even more important than digital, right? So I actually kind of agree with him. So let me just say before I go, where does the big data come from? I actually see that there are two major sources that we don't think about. If you look at a supermarket, we have the data, all oh, this one, there's no difference. Medical record, we have all these new medical record, but the two things that's new is actually social media data. All the YouTube, all the Google search, all the Twitter. These are all new source of information that we don't have it 10 years ago. And the second source of information that's very powerful is imaging of brain, all the DNA data. Those are for new, quite, quite, quite recent. But these are the two new sources of information that make it five extra five every two. And I actually don't think a lot of people analyze those data. Uh, I'm going to show you two examples that we did, uh, just to give you a sense of how actually you ask the right question, you can actually get a lot of knowledge from the data that we have. So I always actually say this to all my PhD students and postdoc, that the bottleneck for writing a paper is not the data, it's actually asking the good question and, and framing it correctly that you can send it to a good place to publish, right? So uh, I'm going to actually mention three things. So we know that big data has a three V. Uh, the first V is the volume. Volume actually, we all, if you are econometric uh, training, larger sample size means smaller something error. Very, very clear cut. So, but, but typically, it doesn't help you to write good papers. I can tell you that. Uh, most of the time, the data you got is big enough that the P is going to be less than 0.05. It's no big deal. You are getting now less than 0.05, something is wrong with your data source, right? But actually, when I was working on my problem, I realized that actually big data sometimes allow you to model the rare event. i give you an example. Breast cancer in Singapore, every 100,000, only about 100 people with breast cancer. If you don't have big data, you can't do a cancer modeling. I need the entire universe of Singapore. It's 5 million people. I can look at entire records. Otherwise, I can't look at the cancer disease. It's very, very few cases every year. And second thing is this, that uh, uh, velocity, which is a faster rate of sampling. So this one, actually, I'm going to come back to this. I'll give you an example. I'm, I actually track taxi, uh, uh, taxi drivers, or cab drivers. They, you can capture it every day how much they make, a daily earning, or you can capture every single trip how much they make. Now you can capture whether every 10 seconds are they making money or resting, or are they looking for passing up, they don't actually do that. But that allowed me to do many things that I can't do it before. I'll show you one example at the very end. So to me, this is a very very powerful source of data that there are many questions I can ask now, I can't ask before because there's something that is very fast. In fact, uh, I actually I have about uh, 20,000 taxis. If I were to actually sample it every 10 seconds, three months data, I have six, uh, 60 terabytes. My whole NUS universe only 100 terabytes. 60 terabytes in three months. I say, can you sample it less frequently so I can have? I don't need that much data. It's too much. I can't, I can't handle it. So I'm actually building a warehouse, a data warehouse at NUS that is going to allow me to go into petabytes. Like, uh, a thousand petabytes. That's what I'm, right? So I'm just kind of telling you. So this is actually very important. But the best one for economics actually is this one, variety. Because when you have a lot of data sources, a lot of variables, it allows you to rule out competing explanation. Because we econometricians like to do a causal effect. X causes Y. But a lot of time, there's a lot of competing explanation. So you're kind of stuck. You can't actually rule out competing explanation. And if you have a lot of variables, you can. I'll show you an example that you can. And to me, that is very, very important. So come back to this. The three Vs. The one that people talk a lot about is this one, but, but frankly, my experience so far is this, that these two are more, allow me to do more. I'll show you uh, all the concrete examples later, right? First one, I would like to give examples, so example kind of speak better than the rest, right? First one is transport. I actually uh, happen to know the CEO of the largest taxi company in Singapore. I go and show up, I have coffee with him, I say, I, love your data set, can you give it to me? He debate, he said, okay, I'll give it to you. But you have to promise me that you help me to do something to I can justify to my board. So I, one thing that they pinpoint was that 
they pay a lot of, a lot of money for insurance premium. So I say, okay, I'll look at your accident uh, of uh, taxi driver, maybe I can figure out a way to, to help you to save money, the driver won't get the, the accident. So can I do that? That's the first project I'm working on. But while I was doing it, I got the data, I can do many, many other things. In fact, I'm writing three more papers on the same data set. One, I'll show you what, I'll just give you one big one and one small one to give you a sense of what I'm trying to do. Second one is about healthcare. So it's clear that healthcare has a lot of data, a lot of data. I'm going to focus on one data because I read a paper in the Indian Journal of Medicine about cancers, breast cancer. I was very fascinated by it. So I decided to work on that problem, to publish a similar paper or even better paper to actually show that what they're doing is correct or not correct. So I'll show it in a second example. So let me just start. But, but ask me a question because I want you to ask me a question because as I was getting the data, my mind kept thinking, what is the best question to ask so that I can get my paper into a top, top journal? That's what I want to do, right? So, so I start with this. So this was actually my ex-students many years ago. And then this was a student I met at Berkeley that he became a, a Chinese, U, a Chinese U at the assistant professor. So he, she spent six months at NUS just working me on this project. It was her first, her first paper, so she was very happy. And, and we went to PNAS, uh, Proceeding a National Academy of Sciences. Uh, for the scientists, thing is a big deal, but social science, we never got a paper into that. But if you are like a physicist, chemist, you would like to have a PNAS paper. So, so my, my university only came about three, three journals, Science, Nature, PNAS, the rest of them. Those are um, cell, but, but these are the three card general interest journals, right? So I'll show you how, how it works. So, so first, uh, I, I have to ask you guys a question, which car is safer, which color is safer, or which car is safer? You guys guess. Blue and yellow, which one is safer? Anybody say blue, raise your hand. I mean, you say yellow, raise your hand. Yellow is safer. But to prove that yellow is safer is not so easy. That's the whole point. Sometimes in life, we are scientists, you have intuition, but that's not good enough. But how do I prove it with all the variables that I have? I'll show you. It's kind of magical. And when I, sh when I send it to the journal, the journal says, I knew they would take it, for sure. And I'll show you at the very end. At the very end, the, this is probably the most famous paper I wrote. Huh? On the day I published it, 63 newspapers globally carry the story, including BBC, including economists. Economists like a big deal, right? All the politicians be economists in Singapore. So my, my prime minister read my article, actually, in the economic I'll show you but anyway, come back to this. So, so the largest taxi company provides a comprehensive data set. So they have a three-year excellent record for all the taxi, and they have about sixteen thousand seven hundred taxi for a randomly chosen sample of twenty. I can't get whole sample; it's too many data coming for me. Uh, we have a three-month data of their real-time driving record. That means exactly how fast they drive, where they are. The GPS data, are they resting? Because in Singapore, the taxi, there are nice status to be occupied with passengers, uh, taking a break, uh, looking for passengers, or uh, off duty, whatever. You, you have the status, right? I have the status data. And finally, I also have the demographic variable about how old they are, how long have they been driving a contract, and so on and so forth. And uh, the company, I thought they have two colors. The, the history goes this way. About 20 years ago, this company was doing very well and bought that company. So it was, it was bought 20 years ago that the blue one is a parent company and the yellow one is a kind of sister company. They kept the colors because it was sentimental for both of them. But the car they used was the same car. It's a, uh, uh, this is called Sonata. Uh, the Hyundai Sonata, right? So this is the car they bought. So whenever they bought it, they bought it, they paint it different colors. The ratio is three to one. That's what we have. Uh, this is a car for 60% of the approximately 27,800 taxis. So they are almost the largest firm and they are very successful. So I need to see. So okay, come back to it. So the research question, which, how do you reduce accident rate, right? So, so we knew that they are blue, is a but, but in what a paper for a top, top journal, I always tell you, what's your picture? I ask my postdoc. Show me a picture that tell me exactly your major research plan. So I need to show a picture. So I, this is my picture. So I actually have 36 months of data 
I have X them per thousand taxi per month. I have to normalize it because they were more blue taxi than yellow taxi. I need to normalize it properly. And we saw it, we showed this picture, right? This is my, my snapshot. And this one was carried by all the newspapers. They'll just show these pictures. Yellow one is always below the blue one almost every single month for except for three months they were almost the same. But this month, that month, and that month. So I don't really that month, right? This month. The three months they were high, slightly high. And that's my, my research finding. So I, I always tell my students that show me a picture of your research finding before I start. What are you trying to explain? So this is I call it the variation in the Y variable, the dependent variable. I want to explain. That you, then you have to ask, what is the variation of the X there? That's how I think. That's how I think. I, that's the way I think about when I talk about research, right? So there's always a data generation process, and then once you figure that out, it's basically how they do it. But then the first thing you have to ask, what are you trying to explain, or what are you trying to rationalize? And then you look at the X there. I'll come back to that. So another way to do it is actually, uh, an average yellow taxi has 6.1 fewer accidents, which is about 9% lower. The p-value is very, very small. Because the data is so huge, right? Of course it's going to be small. So I actually don't expect the p-value to be anything less than 0.001, of course. Because the sample size is huge. And, but this is the major finding. So first, I, I have to figure out why. So there are, if you are economics training, you, first thing you should come to your mind, maybe it's the drivers. Has to be. That's what economics people think, right? Cause selection effect. The guy who actually the safe driver all drive the yellow taxi. The not safe driver all drive the blue taxi. That's the way you think about it. Which is the right way. Not bad. But how do you rule that as a competing explanation? Oh, yeah. Are they managed differently? Okay, they are actually under the same management team. In fact, when you will join the company, they will actually flip a coin to decide on the one third, two third, uh, uh, which taxi you drive. So it's a random assignment. At least for the last 10 years they've been doing it. You drive before that, but they won't ask you to change the taxi. But, but before, now they actually also, the maintenance policy of the car is identical. They send every two months go for servicing same for both taxi. Because it's impossible to maintain two department, two hiring. So it's a century hiring when you want to hire, you want to actually join the company. You join one company, but you're assigned to different color of the taxi. The reason why they carry two different colors was sentimental reason. That was the only reason. Any questions? Okay. So, so how do you rule out the driver hypothesis? I, I'm going to show you a bunch, but the ultimate, ultimate color test is what? The same driver drive both colors, that's the best. Think about, think about how to do a, a, a random control experiment, right? So let's say, like Jian uh, 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 Lao show up. 50% I go into blue, then I get him to uh, yellow, then I get him to dry, see which one is safer. That's the test. But we do not have that. Fortunately, we have a group of people who drive part-time. They will assign yellow and blue during certain duration. So we can track those group of people. I'll come back to it at the very end. But there are other ways of looking at it too, right? So I actually start by saying that driver or yellow taxi are more experienced driver. Is it true? Driver or yellow taxi actually have different driving and working behavior. So I actually look at the driving speed. No difference. Uh, all this we've gone through it. First, we compare the age group. Maybe older people are safer driver or not so safe driver. Education, no difference. Uh, experience, no difference. And also the driving speed is no different. So we actually look at that. This is the, what the demographic is. Driving behavior, first, they make exactly the same uh, number of minutes work is very similar. How much money they make per day is very similar. And when they are on break, when they look for passengers, when they are passengers on board, very similar on both sides. So actually the reviewer asked, how about the driving speed? We have in the, in the paper a, a plot. The driving speed never deviate. Very similar. Because Singapore has a strict rule. You drive too far, you got a ticket. There's a lot of electronic cameras. The camera will look at your speed and I actually detect you, I actually got a ticket when I first went back to Singapore about two years ago. I did not know. It's 40 miles an hour, I drive 50, I got a ticket. It's a set your ticket without stopping you. Right. So the, the drivers are actually are very careful. So 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 then it cannot be a driver. So it has to be colors, but how do you prove it's colors? 
So I'll show you how I prove it. So the color conjecture is that since we cannot attribute the different accident rate to differences in driving, demographic, and behavior, we look at the colors. And I, uh, uh, Jay Lao asked, right, the company uses the same model of car and enforces the same maintenance policy for all taxi. So color is the only one. But how do you prove colors? So we have, luckily, we have two things I'll show you. First, if color is more visible and if you are in front and behind you, I'm less likely to bang into a yellow than bang into a blue. Is it true? So think about case that somebody is at fault. Your taxi driver is not at fault. And you are, the, the taxi suddenly stop and someone from behind bang you from behind, right? If you are a yellow one, I can see you better, I will bang, don't bang into your back. Is it true? Just like, Second, about lighting. Because in Singapore, actually, most of the places are actually have street lighting. So in street lighting, when the lighting is actually not in the daylight, street light is at night when you have the lighting of the street lights, does yellow actually do better in street lighting because yellow becomes more visible at night? And in both cases, it is true when you have an interaction, right? Okay, show you. So this is taxi in front, taxi behind. So the difference here is about uh, less than two points. This is about more than four points. Uh, well, uh, this is the difference here is bigger than this one, right? And when there's complete darkness, actually, this is actually this. Oh, this is the rest of the uh, accident. So you can see that this is actually more dramatic than that one. At least uh, you actually get a sense that it might be about lightings, street lightings. The difference is much bigger than when in the daylight. Okay, it might be the case. And then we have finally, I actually do an interaction where when you're two by two, taxi in front, taxi behind, street lightings, daylight. If they were completely actually in color has no effects, it should be 0.25 because the number of taxis is four, three to one, remember? Uh, one blue, uh, three, uh, three blue, one yellow. So, but you can see that when you're interacting, street lighting and taxi in front, this is the most dramatic one, where yellow is a lot less likely. It should be 25 plus 5 stars, it's about 7% or I'm just telling you, okay, so that suggests something. But the ultimate, ultimate killer thing, luckily we have the data. Uh, the reviewers, well, I'm still not convinced. The reviewers are very tough. I thought this was pretty convincing, right? Are you guys convinced? Are you convinced? I'm convinced, but they say not convinced. So I actually had to back look at a subset of the, the drivers on both colors. Uh, about 868 drivers drove taxi of both colors driving a test for the color conjecture. So we have a very simple a driver fixed effects and I look at yellows as the potential one and this is on a daily basis. The one is on a monthly basis, right? Monthly basis, 1,000 taxi. On the daily basis, we work backward and it turned out that it's about 6.2, which is about close to 6.1 that we got from the, remember this, 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 this one, this one. 6.1. If I do it for the driver of, of two colors, it turned out that the difference is about 6.2 accident per thousand taxi uh, per month. That's not bad. So this one actually uh, make the paper got accepted. This one. Uh, uh, even though I thought I convinced them, but they're not convinced. So this one really knew the paper. And reviewers cannot argue anymore. It cannot be a driver selection. Because if the driver selection, could now the driver do both. In the ideal world, actually, I always tell my students to think of in the ideal when you have control for everything, what would be the ideal test? Two colors, randomly assigned, and you drive and see what happens. And that's the ideal one. But this is close to that. All right? Very close. All right? So let me actually. And we got it published. Uh, we also compute the saving. If you save 6.1 accident per thousand taxi per month, the company have uh, 12,525 uh, blue taxi. You convert this to yellow, how much accident you save? You save about 9, 17 accident per year. And how much money you save? You can compute it, about $2 million. Like that. So I actually didn't manage to convince them to change the color. But I changed, I convinced the ministry to change the buses to yellow. They say the new best buses will be all yellow. Uh, because the company say because the blue one is their corporate company. The parent company is their brand. They don't want to change their brand. But I say you, you're saving a lot of money. They say you cannot. So, so now they are basically changing the mix from one to three to slightly to 
fictitious. Okay, anyway. Conclusions? Uh, yellow taxi were more noticeable than blue taxi, especially in street lighting and in front of other vehicles. Other drivers are better able to avoid hitting. So it's basically, the idea is very simple. You are yellow, people don't hit you. That's the whole point. Uh, uh, unlike, uh, okay, let me pause here, right? And, and I prove it by, not by clever math. Huh? So I actually tell you this, that when you have good data, you don't need clever math, uh, very clever math. If you don't have data, you need a lot of math. I can tell this. Uh, writing big data science papers, if you have a lot of data, actually it's quite easy to do. That's why the math doesn't take us very long. Because you can, uh, you can do it when you're undergraduate degree, you can do all the math I do. It's not so difficult. It's regression, how difficult is that? Uh, I mean, fixed effect. Really not that difficult. I'm just saying it's really not that difficult, right? So, so, but you do need the good data. You need to ask the good questions so that they actually allow you to actually write a good paper. So actually, the nice thing about PNS, they actually track uh, how many news outlets pick out your, your papers, and then uh, this is the economist actually papers, and you guys can look at it. Uh, I don't know, it was the same day that the paper appears. It's kind of nice. Uh, actually, the best one was me because the Facebook, when my Minister of Education Facebook page, it posted my article there, which is not the not best announcement I can get, right? But it will post it there. But let me pause here. So I've used the data for many, many things. I just want to show you one thing that I thought was useful and get you a set to text. So I was actually interested in this question. Do driver, the taxi driver suffer from sun cost value? I'm a behavioral person. Uh, how do you prove this? So some cost fallacy occur when we choose our current action based on past decision rather than on the rational choice that makes fun you do it at this point uh, in time. I'll give you an example, right? So I actually start by the, the, this one you will appreciate. So can there I, are a two by you, you compare just uh, yellow and the blue, yeah. but you don't compare yellow with other color the, the company only has two colors. Yeah, but then how can you recommend all taxi can I actually don't Suppose I if they are out of color, safer. Good point. Uh, excellent point. For this, we only recommend to the company uh, to paint the blue to yellow. But there are some colors that they are, for example, some that's red, they're also green. We don't have any data for that. But there are many, many research done in psychology about actually which color is more visible. So if you read this article in economics, Actually, in the University of Chicago, 100 years ago, they did a study about which colors should be given for taxi. They also chose them. Uh, it's, really, it's, a, it's, it's a survey study, not a pure study. But the point is what they can. I don't want to overgeneralize it. We are simply saying that for this company, yellow is better than blue. Uh, yellow is better than blue. That's, but, but in fact, country, but the relevant question is not that. If you have many, many people in yellow, would that actually affect the equilibrium of people's perception, right? That's the more relevant. We did a check. In Singapore, about 1.2% of the car are yellow, including the taxi. If you put every taxi yellow, it will go to 2.3%. Yellow is about 10%. And blue is about 10%. Blue. A lot of cars are blue. So, so I actually don't think if you were to paint all taxi in yellow, it wouldn't affect the perception of yellow being noticeable. That's it. I'll come back. Okay, I hope I answered the question. Right? Come back to this. So I want to actually go to. So this one actually, uh, this is actually somebody going to an uh, airport, passenger or bought, yes or no. That means you drive to the airport, empty car or occupied with somebody, right? And the passenger going out, yes and no. So you notice that if you go to the airport, empty, no car, no passengers, you're more likely to drive away with the passengers. If you go to an airport with no passengers, uh, with passengers, you are you are less likely to you are more likely to leave car with, the, with 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 nobody. And why? So my my guess, my intuition is this: right? this group of people going in, they need to get a passenger because they drive all the way out so far away. They have a sunk cost fallacy. Like I drove there, I spent all my fuel, I take all my time to go there. I must get a passenger. For the guy who go there with a passengers ready. They should go there and just, uh, oh, if I get paid, I'm lucky, but I'm okay with it. But, but this is irrational. They should not be, the, they should be identical, right? When you reach there, you look at the demand and supply, and then whether you should stay or not stay, right? So I look at, this is uh, every 15 minutes, you can see. 
passengers are uh, on board, yes. So this is actually, uh, uh, okay, so this is, you go in, uh, out probably yes for in, no. So this is a guy who go in empty car. They are more likely to actually pick up a passenger. This is actually 24 hours time slot. And then if we, be, uh, we carry it with out, yes. When the in is yes, this is a, you can see the gap is very systematic. At every minute, so to me this is called irrational behavior. You agree? Because the demand, when you reach the airport, your behavior should not be a function of how you get in. It should be part independent. Can I ask you something? Is it possible that um, the empty car, uh, empty taxes on terrorists is because uh, somebody called? No, I can check. It's not. It's a very good question. So they all go there without, we call it on call. On call, you have to pay extra money. So I knew how much money they made was the on call. I noticed that. So when you're on call, the thing will flag up on call. So this one took away all the on call. There are very few people on call. In fact, most people, if you arrive in Singapore airport, you will see that there will be a taxi queue. So typically, you are coming in, there's a queue on the demand side, but there's a queue on the supply side, there's a huge queue on the taxi drivers. So people have to ask, do I want to join the queue or just go back to the city? But they go there with a goal to pick up patients. Yeah. Others go out just to release passengers. So goal was different. But the problem is that your behavior should not be different once you reach there. This is a past dependence. Yeah. It should be part independent if you are rational. That's the whole point. But you're right. Your intuition is like we we human beings, right? I go there, I have a goal. I must reach my goal. But the point is that as a rational decision maker, it should not be a function of what you get there. It should be when I reach there. If I see the demand and supply is good, I, I wait, otherwise I leave. But if you are path dependent, then you are irrational. That's the whole point about some cost balancing. We need something well. Uh, how well is that? Well. Okay, I so, so. So the guy will go there actually, but we also look at how much money they made in the entire day, so it's not well effect. Oh, okay. You're quite, quite right, because I know how much they make. <laughs> I know by the time how much they made already. So typically the guy will go there, it's not ahead of the guy who will go there and only for one small group of people that are a little ahead, but you're right. It's income effect, we call it income effect. You're totally right. We can control for that. It's because I know how much they make. And do, do you exclude the people, the uh, red farm, do you exclude the people who were on call to check out and Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't exclude people who go there for uh, rest stop because they, some people have to go and eat. Okay? Because they, uh, uh, this uh, airport has been there for three hours, they're eating their lunch. So we take out those, we can, because I know what their status is, right? So I'll come back to this, right? So this is my next paper, the picture again. I haven't done it, but I'm just telling you that I like to have a big picture that is so compelling that you know there's an effect size, right? It's not a fake one. That's what I mean. Uh, but this one can only be possible because I know the minutes by minutes demand and supply. If I only have a daily one, I can't do these pictures anymore. It would be a daily one. It could be a selection of a different point in time. But now I know, I actually know actually that with GPS data, I know exactly how long they're there, how long when drop has how long it only take about what, less than a minute to go from a job point to an arrival point. Again. It's really cool. Anyway, I haven't finished this paper yet, so wish me luck, okay? I, 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 I'm trying to, I just want to give you, so, so we are actually looking at two possible hypotheses. There's a selection, we didn't take away the selection. Uh, there's a sun cost, of, but we are just, I just finished this, that this is unlikely to happen. We control for this, it's still a huge effect. So let me pause it. So I'm, I'm actually coming back to this, you guys, right? So I, I don't know where I'm gonna send these papers, but having a nice picture for a big paper is very important. So my first papers was this nice pictures. So the second paper, this is a nice picture that I'm going to show. Before I get anybody excited about this, right? This one. Okay, I'm pausing. Any question? Before I go to the how can one is a very complicated, but I'll go through that time. So, but again, your intuition is right, but it's not right. I call it, actually, I, I create this called path dependency. But in consumption, there is a habit. If you become a hobby, you are satisfied then. This is not your consumption. Time. This is a this is a, uh, a worker behavior. If you do this, actually you make less money. You go the ration, you go there, you wait too long, you could make more money by leaving. So that's a, I'm gonna prove the second part point is consequential. You waited too long, you make less money the whole day, or you had to work longer hours. So I'm gonna prove that. But your point is well taken. The 
consumption part difference is called happy but it's very common, but this one should not be. That's, the cause, that's why they call it some cause parameters. This is a irrational behavior on, this, on, the, on the driver's side. So let me go to the healthcare one. So this one actually, uh, I, I, I close to submitting the papers. I would love to get some feedback. Uh, it's a very difficult one. I'll tell you how I get the inspiration. We got a professor in uh, a deal, who a breast cancer expert to be on the team because she will give us some insight whether what we do is sensible. Uh, I get this guy who's really smart guy who actually got an NEIO training from Stanford. He's, he's, he's the guy who's behind the econometric. I'm the guy who brings everybody together and then asks the right question. That's what I did. So, uh, but I actually know how to judge whether the guy is good or not good. Right? Because I always tell people, you need to assemble a team. So, because the thing, the thing is very difficult. Not everybody can do, I mean, this, this guy can do all the endogeneity, all this thing. He's really, really tough. And then we have a, my postdoc who has been working on this too. So let me just tell you. So we have Singapore public in, in Taiwan too. We call it Singapore Cancer Registry. Every cancer patient in Singapore has to be registered with the cancer registry. So they typically tell you when you detect with cancers, they will tell you your stage, what stage cancer is, what kind of cancer is, how big the tumor is, and so on and so forth. And then when you die, they will tell you. They will record you. So this is a case of some some side is a census. Census means every record is being recorded. I actually need this, by the way. If I don't need this, I don't have enough data point. In fact, even with this, my number of data point is just sufficient, but not great. Because the number of cases for breast cancer is not as high as I expected. And I need to do estimation. I need the data. Data with hundred because. Every 100,000, there's only like 150 people. I need to have more people, right? So the ratio is very small. So second thing is about screening. So this one, unlike all the work that has been done, most of the screening data is based on survey. They ask the women, in the last 24 months, do you go for a mammographic screening? Here, no. I actually have a screening record from all the government screening in Singapore. If you go for public screening, I have the records of the name. So I look at the name here. And the IC number or the uh, ID numbers, I link the two together. So I know when you go for screening, how old are you, the ethnicity of the people, whether you're Malay, Chinese, any family history of your family, influential or repetitive. I know all the screening that you have for everybody, for I'll say 60% of the screening in Singapore is all captured. Not everybody, yeah, I have to say. So BSS and SCR did not contain a unit. ID, which is actually, we link them together. Uh, uh, but this is a, a rare, I mean, so lucky, right? They link them, I need to go to a central location to gain access to the data. I can't actually pick it up. It's highly confidential. So we also have a sensor data that we have. They ask for screening. We use this to calibrate how many people got screened, how many people got screened. But the basic point I want to actually emphasize was that those who go for public and private, the differences is very small. There's no difference. So you can assume that even though it's six months, like almost like populations. Uh, finally, uh, typically we only focus on people who are above 40 years old. Very rare for women get breast cancer when they are below 40. That's what we, we see here. So the qu question is this. Huh? I'll, I'll co come back to you. Why do I focus on these questions? So in Singapore, the current level of mammography screening is about 24%. So if you actually, uh, typical women who are above 40, uh, I said in the last 24 months, only 24% go for screen. In, in, in uh, Taiwan, how many percent? Pretty high. In the, in the uh, European countries, it's about 75-80%. So the ministry director keep coming to me, can you actually tell me should I actually give up screening for free? Now it's not for free. They have to pay. Uh, and can we actually increase the coverage? So, my big question was, how many lives would I be saving with increased screening coverage? Uh, let me tell you what the paper I read was inspiring me, right? The first paper I read was this paper by a guy called Gilbert Walsh. You should Google this guy. This guy wrote a lot of paper on overdiagnosis. It's all about overdiagnosis, right? But he actually, the doctors are very strange, huh? They don't have a lot of math training. But they ask them good questions. And they only show two pictures in their paper in New England Journal of Medicine. So this, this, this journal actually, in fact, is 60. Remember, uh, 
呃，杰老师讲那个 journal economics is do， 你算 sixty， 你明天在我一 publish a paper， 明天读一个 sixty times citation， I mean it's really high profile journal， right？ So they show this based on a survey. Mine is actually on actual transaction data. This is based on survey. In 1984, the screening may be about 30 percent. It go all the way to about 70 percent. So what does screening do for you? Let's think. If you go for screening often, I detect you when you are in early stage. Then I can cure you. Then you will be okay. So screening should save a lot of life. Agree? Because this whole point of screening, you go and then you start and fast and start and eat. But he's going to show you different. He's going to show you the basic finding for him was actually no. He said that despite all this done in the 80 to the 2008, he show you this. The early stage cancer go up dramatically. More people are detected with uh, breast cancers, but the one who is dying or late stage cancer stay the same. Maybe drop only slightly, which is the Big surprise. So he concluded, that's all, he has two diagrams, there's no math, no, no math. Huh? That, you read the paper, this paper is cited about almost uh, 800 times now, uh, since it was published in 2012. So very straightforward finding two pictures. So he concluded that the guy who got detected all these people, they are actually not going to go to late stage cancer anyway. They are the guy who has basically have forced a lot. They have some little tumor. But this tumor is going to kill them. It's not going to actually get aggressive. It's going to stay as early stage forever. So his point is very simple. A lot of time we increase the screening, all these people got detected, just like people have prostate cancer, they'll die with breast cancer, but not die of breast cancer. That means they won't be killed by breast cancer. So he said these are all a waste of money. We call it overdiagnosis. Let me pause. That was, that, I'm, I'm telling you, I just present a paper in 10 minutes for you. This graph, that graph, a, a, a paper, and there's no man, nothing. That's it. That was his argument. Very loose. I mean, economic people can think of many competing explanations, right? We're all like very smart. But for them, it's just two pictures. But I actually want to actually make this point very clear. He asked a very good question. He asked a question that we all agree. Screening should save life. But his point was screening doesn't save life. Don't waste money. And worst case, I feel sorry for actually women. Huh? This group of people who go for surgery, all waste of money and pay because they won't die of breast cancer anyway. I feel sorry for that group. Actually, my sister go, go through this also. Uh, my sister actually uh, got diagnosed with stage 1 cancer. I was going through this paper when she got it. I don't know how to advise her. My, my heart tell me that, my mind tell me that she just wait and don't do anything. But she went to operation, very painful. She had to remove her breast, and then the breast implant, go through like very painful six months of uh, recovery. And at the end, we still don't know whether she belonged to, she's going to be here or there, right? I mean, the whole point about this is that this one, when you go up, this thing to come down. That's the whole point. That's what screening is all about. Get rid of the nation's cancer so I fix you before it got worse, right? It doesn't happen. So let me pause it. So I was, because of this paper, I was very intrigued by this whole thing. And also I want to know what does overdiagnosis mean. So his basic conclusion is very simple. There's overdiagnosis in the US, that means you overdiagnose a patient. Most additional detection of early stage cancer will not lead to this thing. That was his conclusion. That's it. Two graphs, one conclusion. High profile journal. What do you think? Apparently, the doctor will know cancer incident, there's no cancer, but you're quite right. I thought of more about, about other things, I'll give you an example. I thought about actually, let's say in the past, you might be dying of heart attack before you got breast cancer. But now we fix the heart attack. So people are more likely to get breast cancer, there's cancer, right? Because your, your other disease was better taken care of, right? And cancer is still not well taken care of. So I thought, exactly like Huan Lao Si, Jian Lao Si Jiang, Maybe because other disease were better taken care of, so breast cancer should go up. Over. But guess what? We got a top high profile paper. And I actually, based on I talked to all the doctors, doctor don't believe 
the output thing that the above cases should go up all the time. It should be stationary. That's what they say. And I, here and I have the same idea, but we, we come to, I actually want to cover that in my estimation, I just with that. Okay. Any more comments on this? Don't you like a, a paper like that? Don't need to do math, let's show two graph, finish. But you got to give them actually a nice car compliment that they actually capture everything into a simple two graph. This one go up, this one stay the same. I would like that. I wish that all the econometricians show me two graphs that is so compelling. A lot of time my econometrician friend keeps showing me the, uh, what's the basic finding I'm trying to explain that I still don't know. Very big. So go back to yourself and ask yourself this question before you start on a big research project. What are you trying to capture? What is the big insight? So this is the big insight for them. Right? Let me tell you why. So I actually start with Singapore. So I actually go to Singapore data. First, I noticed that over the years, the number of cases for early stage go up, late stage go up. This is all oh, 100,000. It's about, you know, going from the low 25 to 750 all the way up. And there's probably aging also. People get older. So during those times, there are very few women who are actually, oh, but this is above 40, right? This, this is above 40, but you're more like, less likely to get 40 or 50. So, so, so there's still a bit of aging effect too. But, but it's gone up nicely. Unlike, unlike the US one, it stayed the same, it went up there, right? So number of screening, actually, this is what happened. Uh, I will actually show you this. The screening actually, in 2005, 2006, government have a big push. So it went up, and then it died off again. Uh, there's a big difference between Malay and non-Malay. It's a very interesting one. In Malay, if you have women, you want to go for breast cancer screening, you have to ask your husband permission because of Muslim. Uh, in fact, every Muslim woman, any of their body be touched by another person to ask their husband permission. So it's a very interesting kind of setup. But that gives us variation, remember? This is my variation on the output. <laughs> I'm looking for variation on the input side, right? So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of learn like a uh, econometrician, right? What is the output I'm trying to vary? Um, so and what, what, if, what could I exploit to explain the output variation, right? So this is first, I saw the variation in across time, there's a change. And also across different sub-segments of people, there's a variation. But obviously, when I explore the Malay and non-Malay variation, I have to be careful. Because often Malay has a more pro different propensity of having cancer than Chinese. So fortunately, I have Indians, which is a good middle ground. So i, I show you uh, what I have here. Uh, okay, so first, I actually, this is why I talked to doctors. Right? Doctor told me that there are three type of individual. First is people who never get cancer. So there are a lot of people who die. Uh, you check their breast, they are fine. Um, they die. They don't have breast cancer. So this is what I call it. Do not develop breast cancers. Uh, type NA is susceptible to contracting only non-aggressive cancer. So they can get uh, early stage but never get late stage cancer. A bit like prostate cancer. I mean the decay rate is so slow and when you die, you won't get that. And, but there's a group of people who are going to get it and go very fast. If they get it, it got worse very fast. So obviously, this group of people go for screening will help a lot. This too doesn't help. Currently, this and this are being mixed to each other. So that you saw type, uh, early stage go up maybe because of this group, but not that group. In the ideal world, you should only screen this group and make it when they're early and cure them just the best. See the point? That's the ideal world, right? But you don't. You basically saw these two groups together because you couldn't tell the difference, right? So the three stages of cancer, actually there are four stages. I, I, I count, no, five. Uh, Non-cancer, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. I combine one and two called early stage. Uh, it means that your chance of getting killed is about 95% of If you are stage three and four, it dropped to from 50 to 10%, very low. Uh, so late stage cancers, uh, but now cancer actually uh, treatment got a lot better, but still, it's, it's almost a death sentence. You are stage four, you almost die, uh, especially for breast cancers. Uh, and uh, we, we, we assume that the cancer is still follow a Marco change condition of type of individual. Before I go into that, I want to actually make one basic point. Uh, that, that's why I think the uh, nutrition of you guys can really make a big difference with data science. Why? Because we care about first, 
endogeneity and pathogeneity. You care a lot about it. In fact, uh, you, you live and try based on endogeneity and uh, 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 heterogeneity. First, screen decision may be endogenous based on what type you are. Maybe you are more likely to get AC because your, your mom is AC. So you become more careful, you're more likely to go for screening. So your screening propensity might be much higher than the NA and NC type. And also the stages. Let's say you are stage two, you're more likely to go for screening than stage one because you, you see your breast not normal, right? And also, the tendency between different groups are different because I, as I show you to you, in this case, screening coverage for, for this is for Chinese, uh, Indian, Malay, you can see that the late stage prevents, uh, uh, proportion. Malay, if the screen less, they are more likely to get actually higher proportion of late stage cancer detection. This one actually is well known among Singaporeans. All my ministry friends know about this one. Uh, the screen coverage is lower, but they got more late stage cancer. So, so in a way, screening helps. Uh, at least in Singapore data. But, but screen cover only 25%. When you hit 80%, it might not help as much. And then also same thing for fire mortality rate. Uh, it's, uh, I can see it, like uh, Malay is actually having a hard time uh, in terms of dying and so on, they're much higher. Uh, and Chinese is much lower. Okay, so, so uh, estimation method is go slow now. So I actually want to actually first say that I actually can show you how I do the estimation based on screening, based on death, and back it up a bunch of things. First, the proportion of the three types of individual. I actually have NC, NA, and AC. Okay, I have that. And the probably getting screened, given the type of individuals, all cell selection allow you to have AC, you are more likely to go for screening than, in fact, NA and uh, NC type. Also, we also have to have transition property of can cancer stage progression. I'll show you the, the little graph afterwards. But then I can then do, I call it counterfactual analysis about actually number of lives saved, but the one that I'm most interested in actually for paper is this one. That paper I just showed you, talk about over-diagnosis in a vague, vague term. I'm going to formally quantify it. I want to actually do this. So the contribution of this paper is going to be formally quantifying the extent of over-diagnosis. That's the paper. I actually finished the draft of the paper. Okay. Yeah, finished it. So <coughs> how do you know the types? Also, uh, do you assume that people know themselves what type they are? So, we assume that people know what type they are, but the model doesn't know what type they are. So, we look at your behavior or screening, and your, whether you, got, you die or not, we pick it up what kind of types you are. So, keep in mind, the AC type will die, this two type will never die. So, if I see you are dead, you have to be AC type, no, no, no question now. So, also, the AC, NA, and C they go for different levels of screening. AC type will be more likely to go for screening because they, are, they know they are the high risk group. They know, they know, but you don't know as a model. Does it make sense? So that's the assumption of the model. It's almost like uh, economics. We can send it to QGA, by the way. But we're thinking of thinking of the New Journal of Medicine. That's what the impact is 60. Uh, QGA is 4. I mean, I'd rather go to it because the citation will be much higher. And medical doctor will love these papers, right? So, come back to this. So that's actually Right. So first, type NC, uh, this is actually cancer free, uh, this one and no cancer detect. So they can go for screening, then they come back. If you have NA, you go down from cancer free to early stage, never go to late stage. Uh, you can get detected for this. And this group of people, I feel sorry by the way. Why? A lot of time they go for operation, it's a waste of money and fear and whatever. It's sad. This uh, Actually, I did this paper partly for this group of people too. I feel sorry for them. I mean, I mean, they literally don't have to go for operation. Like many people with prostate cancer never go for operation. You don't have to. I mean, you, you, you're gonna die before the cancer can kill you. Don't worry. Because the decay rate is so small, it's almost impossible. And this is the one that really will benefit from cancer. So cancer uh, free, Go down to early stage, late stage, there are different propensity of screening, going for screening. And this one, in the data, we don't have the transition from this to that, we only have transition from here to die, or from here to die, right? We have that. So, anytime you are dead, it means you belong to this type. So, and that's the way we back it up. But, but sometimes you never die, because you are this type, I never die. 
you mentioned this too. Uh, but there are ways to identify them separately. Uh, more so, more so. Okay, come back to this. So, uh, we had to look at the transition probably, but this one I just want to actually go out very quickly with you, right? First, if you are not NC, you never go from no to early state because it's impossible, you never get cancer. If you are non-aggressive, you never come early to late because you never get aggressive, you never go to late stage. All three, you can't go from no to L, you have to go through the E first, it's just a Markov change. The rest of the thing, if you are NA, you can go from no to early, no to early for aggressive, then early to late state can be this. So this one actually we need help from the doctors. Apparently, as you get older, you might be going from the NA to the AC type. It's possible. That means the earlier on the breast tumor you got, you will never go aggressive, but as you change your age group, suddenly you might become the AC type. So we have to allow for that. Uh, and then obviously there's a death prob probability if you are the, the, the AC type, right? We're going to talk about this, this one. Die, die. Uh, because the cancer register allow me to know whether you die or not die, right? So actually based on this, uh, you, again, based on screening, you observe death and the cancer incident, I can back it up, the types, the screening capacity, trust me. I actually, uh, I trust this guy. I told you, remember my co-authors? This guy. The guy is really good. I, I know him for many years. Uh, he's really strong. He's just up to 10 years. He's got 10 years. He's just got 10 years. He's really, very really good. Uh, and anyway, we work out a man. I, I think the, the thing I learned about this whole thing is this, that we did these papers in order to answer a policy question about what the screen coverage should be, but more importantly, actually provide a much sharper definition of over-diagnosis, what it means. So the way we define it is very simple. The ratio of basically over diagnosis means this divided by this plus that. Okay? That's over diagnosis. Because this group of people is over diagnosed, don't it? So we can actually mathematically quantify very nicely, right? So come back to this. Uh, based on this, we estimate the, the data based on the screening records and the cancer registry. 55% are about NC. So in the world, there's a 55% of women will never get, when you, you, you are dead, uh, everything is fine. You don't have breast cancer. Uh, about 23% got NA, that means they got early stage, but they, some of them go for treatments, but it's kind of a waste of money. And 22% actually got A, aggressive cancer. This group of people are really the guy group of people you should go after. Let's say, let's say we have a genetic test. Okay. I can test whether you are this, this, or that. My screening rate has to be only 22%. I just focus on this group of people. Does everybody go for a genetic test. You got this. Go for screening every uh, 24 months. Make sure you go for screening 100% compulsory. I'm done with it. So a group of people, my and US doctors, uh, trying to figure out whether they can look at genetic profile, see whether you are which type you are. Uh, but uh, it's too good to be. Not, nobody has figured out something to do with it. Okay. Uh, this one actually economics would like. Eh? The screening rate differs for the three types. Uh, individual cells let into a screening region based on that type. So, so the AC is 27 times more likely than the NC, and NA is four times more likely than the uh, uh, NC in terms of screening. So that means it's very powerful. So it's a huge cell selection. It also means that there's a diminishing return for screening coverage. The first 1% majority is going to be AC, NA, and, and very few NC. As you push the screening coverage higher and higher, there'll be more NC and AC and then people showing up. Agree? Because they, they're more likely, so they're gonna show up first. So as you push, so I'm actually telling the government not to push too hard. Because as you push too hard, all these people are gonna show up, and some of them gonna see some little thing there, and they get pregnant, oh, what should I do? And most doctors in Singapore are asking for operation. It's just, just be safe. I mean, there's a, COI too, computer and they are operation, operation, they need money, right? So it's, it's a, there's, a, there's a chair called COI. The recommended thing is you should remove it right away. And I actually think that you should just wait for many people. Yeah. So as you can see from here, the screen cover 25, 50, 75 percent 
Uh, let's focus on the NA. As you can see, there's a huge increase in NA people being detected per 100 people. The number of incidents for AC early stage almost flat after this. You see that? So if it go beyond 50% and go to 60%, the increase is very, very small. You're going to save just one more person. So I actually draw a continuous curve for it. When it hits 60%, Going for that is almost like you're not getting any more mileage already. So I actually recommend the, doc, uh, the Ministry of Health to go up to 60% of the time. Anything above that, if they want to go, it's okay. Don't force them. Don't give them too much incentive. Because I actually feel sorry for the guy who showed up at an NA and got operation and then for whole life they have to live with the, with the fear they got cancer, but they never get, get cancer. It's terrible. So this is called uh not know how to know. Because you put on it, Individual cells, like this actually is a very powerful finding for economics people like I send the QJE, it's just a selection effect, it's kind of nice one. And then I push back to the doctor, because all the doctor want 100% screening. All the famous doctor I talk to, we should push every people for screening. My point is, it's, it's actually hurting the individual. You're going to see everybody who are NA, and force everybody to go for operation, which is kind of sad. And the system is quite smart. The individual is very smart. They actually are really gone. All the AC really gone by the screen of 60, but they're all gone already. There are no more AC people around. Because they have been told by well, you know, their sister got breast cancer, they'll go. The doctor said, well, do you have any family history yet? You should go. So that's why the propensity is 27% higher, which is very common because a typical doctor a survey, they'll ask you, you have any family members got breast cancer? Yes, they ask you to go for screening. Okay, finally, actually, as I say, once you're pushed about 60%, you're less likely to do it. Okay, I haven't finished, uh, I haven't sent out this paper yet, because I always don't want to send it out so quickly. We're iterating it, getting it just right. Uh, we just extended this part, as I was telling you. This one, just to make sure that it will allow for this to happen. As you get older, you're more likely to go to AC. How does it affect the finding? So far, we Perturb the model a little bit, it doesn't affect the major finding of the selection effects. The breakdown never changed that much. It's always like about one quarter, one quarter, 50%. Please do something. Now you have these proportions. Yeah. Um, are there any medical uh, research evidence supporting these proportions? Uh, I've not seen any. I've tried to work with somebody who's doing the genome report. Would you link it with this? No, I've not seen any. Most of the genome research is very specific kind of cancer, not like very specific kind, and their R square is very low. So I haven't seen anything that's so compelling as this one. So, so keep in mind that the tweet type, I actually don't make up the tweet type. When I'm talking to the doctors, oh, they say there's a group of people who cancer get very aggressive, very fast. There's a group of people who know cancer, no, we observe it never happens, it's okay, but we have to monitor them, and there's a group of people who get cancer. So based on what they say, I. I mathematize it to three times, you know, right? No one says three times. I made up to three times. Actually, uh, we think of having four times. Four times means this group of people, we have different different uh, aggressive rate, how fast it goes. But then I say, yeah, we don't really need it. We just pull them together, right? So according to a group of people, there's aggressive one, but they also have different kind of aggressiveness. So I thought that then would be four times. Our data is not rich enough to do so. So I notice that. This group of people will die. So anybody you are dying belongs to this group. But if you don't die, it can be either one of this when you are treated. But if you get you can list this cancer, you have to be this type too. It cannot be this type. So so the only hard one is actually when you are early stage, I don't know whether you are which type. But I look at your screening regime, I can back it up. Frankly, I just want to get a paper to the New York Journal of Medicine. So our, our, our strategy, we send it there. If you don't get it in, uh, we'll go to QJ. Right?
I think I have the papers here. I think uh, I went straight, uh, we have we have a draft for a lot for like six months already. I just trying to be very careful and so on. So I I have the papers already. As you can see, we, we frame it as ex exactly that, quantifying the over diagnosis. Uh, you have to kind of write in the in the star and so on, right? So we've been actually playing with it, and uh, there the way you write it also has to be different and so on. Like there are a lot of car. Kind of, it's actually, it's much easier to write for for natural science paper because they don't ask for a lot of justification, framing. They just show them the result and methods, and then that's it. Bomb. They they they, uh, they they were just uh. It's very very nice to write for those journals because they forces you to be very simple and to the point. You don't have to BS that much, basically. But actually, this pie chart itself. Can be yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I hope I hope so. But uh, come back to this. Huh? I've been actually trying, uh, as I say, I have two data sets. Uh, it took me a while to get this data set this much longer. Uh, but there are actually a lot of questions I want to ask. The Malay side, could I do intervention on the Malay side? Would they change the cause of cancer history, right? Because currently, they are not going for screening enough. We know that. And screening will help them a lot, right, based on my research findings. Even Chinese not going for screening enough. How could I do intervention to come and see over time what happened? It would be very nice to write a paper like that. Currently, we, we can't because it's kind of sensitive to talk about. So. But, uh, okay, any, any more questions? Uh, again, uh, uh, I, I want to actually point again to the effect of this. It's what question you ask is more important than what data you have. And give me a beautiful picture that shows you your major finding in one picture. Always think about it. Especially for PhD students and postdocs, uh, don't get too caught up with the methods. And stuff. Uh, the method actually, someone will teach you how to do it. Be like, I actually, when I knew this, I know this is going to be difficult. I get the Shemek Leon, Shemek is the power, powerful econometrician. Uh, you will get it done, and we actually allow for variation of time. All this is the paper, very complicated. But, uh, there's a time factor too, there's actually uh, different. Different people, different segment actually, a lot of different kind of time trend. He does, does it. Yeah. I actually work with him very right carefully. Any more questions? Yeah. Is it likely to have a big data through this series, correct? I mean, uh, I would actually, I, I just, frankly, this paper was written mostly for this, uh, this one. Over diagnosis. I just want to quantify. I have a formal way of quantifying it. That was my goal. Uh, <laughs> the clinic time actually came from the doctor. If you talk to most doctors, they will, they will talk vaguely in words like, oh, there's, you want to get aggressive cancer, you're talking. Very fast. And, and they, 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 they don't use our three type NC or the table. They don't they talk about it. We, as a mathematician, we mathematize it the way they describe it. So it's, it's very clear. They are, basically, they always talk about three people. Not, never get cancer, get aggressive cancer, not aggressive cancer. If you ask them, that's what the way they talk about it. And they look at the tumor, they could tell it's aggressive, not aggressive. So there's no tumor, but tumor, aggressive, not aggressive. Yeah. They will tell you the tumor. But they taught me something new. That, let's say somebody got non-aggressive when they are 40, but if 55 can get something aggressive, that means your type can change. That's what I was told is possible. That's what we allowed. But uh, we have the three types, uh, maybe, in actual fact, there are probably more types. I think within the, the aggressive one, there are probably different rate or different things, but there was too much, because our data is not good enough, unless I have millions of records, right? I only have about uh, two and a half million records. I mean, Singapore is the only one, the whole country has five million, we may only do for five million, you restrict the 40 years or above, it's actually a lot smaller. So, and it only happened in 100,000 years, it's not that many people. But in China, probably I can do a lot. But anyway, I, I had to be realistic about the number of types that I have. I would say three types are a good start, potentially be four or five types, but I only have data for three types. Any more questions? the implication I would say treatment are not necessary for many people with the screen coverage is quite high. So 
So you go to us, let's say you, let's say you, are, you don't have family history, you are early stage, honestly, you ask me for advice, I say, monitor and don't do anything. Just monitor closely. For six months, for for screening. Because your treatment is not free, it's not just like going to take a pill and die. The treatment is very high cost. Not just the money, it's psychological cost. I see my sister going through it's very painful. How she has breast pain removed, she put the breast in front, it's six months to recover. And now she, I was told that every 15 years she had to, to change her breast in front. It's quite, 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 it's quite a high drama, not so easy thing to do. And, but, posterior probability, I'll come back to this, let's say, Let's say you were, based on age group and, and, and your, your history, I can give you a posterior probability that given your background, you're more likely to be this or that, I can, I can give you. But it's still a probability. It's like you have 75% chance here, 25% chance there. You still, do you want to go for operation or not? You still have to decide. I can't give you 100% chance. There's no way. So my model can be have a calculators based on your age group, uh, your propensity and the screening rate, I can give you condition of your screening history and your age group, you are more likely to be in NA or... Because now it's about 50-50 untraditional probability, right? But the conditional probability could be much higher as... Well, as you, get, as you get older, you'll be here. When you're younger, you're likely to be here. So when you're young, I would say it's awesome. But it's, it's a good question. I can't say it because I'm not a doctor. But you would ask me honestly if my own family members have it. If my sister is very different because a husband really want to go for I think husband is afraid of uh, making a mistake. But she, he doesn't understand his important cause of my sister. Because you're not going to offer shop, because it's easy for you to say no to operation. Right? 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 The treatment is a high cost of treatment. Because this is a high cost of treatment. I I I I Because 因为你不知道你是这个还是那个 五十在这里,百分之九十五在这里,要不要去治啊,我问你,在我问你,你找你一个,一个,一个,一个朋友是你的。我跟你跟你讲,我可以跟你predict,百分之五在这里,百分之九十五在这里,你要不要去治,你找
我问问你很重要，所以我我们现在每个大学都有 subscribe 的 scoop scoopers， scoopers 就是每个 publication 的 database， 所以你可以知道在 engineering 有 about five million records on all the publisher， five million papers。我做我们国立大学一年大概有一万篇文章，啊，所以我现在我很我很一个问题，我很有兴趣，我觉得 science 跟年轻人有兴趣的时候，到底整个我们讲 scientific publication project 里面有 favoritism， 里面有 favoritism 就是有些人得到比比较 low bar， so everybody in the bar is here， you're my friend the bar is， how can I prove？ 假如这个我就加一个 simple f a v o r i t i s m 容易 prove， 怎样 prove？ 你就用我们的 economic logic。假如你的 bus 每个的 bus 在这里，你的 bus 在这里，你的 paper 比人家差，你就进啦。假如我们 judge 你的 paper 好不好 ，by number of citation you receive， yeah， let's look at the group of people who got favor for low citation， right？ So I, for example， let's say I go to QJ papers now， all the Harvard graduate who got paper in QJ， I look at their long term impact， are they getting long？ Lower long term impact than the regular paper that is done by QJE. I can prove it already. If it gets lower, they have favored this one. But the world is a little more complicated than that. But, but, but also make it interesting. Because let's say you are in my club, I can also give you a free citation. Then I'll see what I'll say. I'll tell people, not really, I'll also sign. I'll tell people, I'll still be able to sign. So, on one hand, the lower bar actually give you lower citation. But you are in the club also, I give you extra citation because you are my friend. So that goes in the reverse way. So I'm trying to tease out the two and writing a paper. And I think my question is interesting. Because I know, if I write a paper, it's like a paper. Actually, in the engineering field, you have to be discriminated against until 80, 85, and after that, the discrimination goes away. It would be a big blow of some paper for science. I can tell you. You know what I'm saying? 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 所以我我准备我今天才开始准备这个，我还没 finish， 这个老板，而且 I also realize that this one I talk to people， so I talk to one guy who's very smart called Carl Shapiro who's actually one of the smartest I O theorists in our generation， right？ 他刚好来新加坡听课堂，他就跟我讲那个 citation 那个 favoritism， not just the bar， I thought he are right because I said more all my friends I never said the bar without my friends， right？ So he gave me an idea that I incorporated into my paper. Sometimes you talk to smart people, they give you good ideas, right? That's what I do. So I also talk to many smart people and what do you think, what do you think, give me ideas, right? So you should just talk, don't be shy in talking to people and get people to kind of give you good ideas. Sometimes talking to smart people really helps you, really helps you. Actually, uh, I should tell you this, that I invite, I call my playmates, uh, playmates means people who are smart. So uh, every year I invite, these two people. Just, their job is to just hang out with me. So I, hang, I, I invited a guy called Matthew Revin, uh, which you probably know, the club managers, very smart behavior in the army. The only thing you need to do is just we meet six times, three hours in the six weeks. Just talk to him. Just sit down and talk about this. And we're working on the paper together too, but, but he's, like, he's so smart that he's such a good idea. So that's what I do. I mean, he, he come, Business club, that's how to teach, that's how to do anything, and give you a nice apartment, and just hang out with you. So you, you should actually start talking to different people and then get ideas to Any more questions? Any more questions? Okay. Okay, uh, Social media data 跟那个呃那个，他可以讲恐怕要几个例子哈。呃，我我我是总觉得 social media data 很多时候你次要的 side effect， 很多不是 side effect， 这个是 pure side。我
Once I don't like a positive, how does it affect drug adoption of the drug compliance? So in that case, you want to make a very good paper because, because I now I am worried that in the United States, many of those positive side effects are totally a self highly selected sample, right? Because if you look at the FDA approval, the whole time you get a sure of side effect, maybe one percent, two percent for a drug, but clearly. 一些我们这些不是很不是很 strong， 就看到哇，这样多人恐怖，你看是不好的 drug， 会可能害死人了什么？他就不吃了，不吃的话，他他病越来越糟糕啊。所以，所以我觉得，你把那两个生物质 combine 就可以做的很很好的东西出来啊。但你只是让他另外一个地方 ，you only see one side， there's another set of information that's really really big。for example， there's one paper on the right 啊，啊，另外一个问题 ，that's Google， when does Google hurt you？ Google search 啊。When does Google search hurt you? Because more information sometimes should be good, right? But in this case, the information is not a IID job. It's a non-IID job to hurt you. And I'm actually very interested. So Google can eat something that like a dog believe. They believe actually it's a wrong belief. That means more than that, the mother doesn't want to give their child to that that immunization, right? Uh, chicken pox, huh? Now they have they have a lot of those diseases coming back to the US because they don't have immunization. 因为他父母亲觉得有一些 side effect， 他担心。That's not good. So that case, Google hurts the population. And 我我对这个很有兴趣，因为我们很多，好像我最近在在给一个 v i d e 在那个贵州的时候，他是个呃大大数据，一个女孩子跟我讲说，一个一个一个一个他不是笨，上海有一个不哪里在一个小城市，有一个人看到一个一个那个 website， 说他的那个 cancer 可以去。把一个上海一个，然他就花了多钱，是叫那个春夏，结果当时不能去嘛，他就开始。But he was misguided. He wasted all his money. He died in Shanghai instead of in another city. It's sad. But there are people like that. 但我们，你是买房？ And how many the belief is completely misguided by data on the internet, which is false data or or partial data or or biased data, right? So. 我我对这个非常有兴趣，就是靠 wrong belief as a result unbiased posting of data， 就是 very interesting concept。And you just write a paper， 啊、uh, ，Google hurts， the one way hurts you， right？ 你看酷的，啊，对对对。什么？谢谢大家。非常感谢何校长的一个很精彩的演讲，然后呃，他跟我们分享怎么样去呃 ask the right question， 而且怎么样去用这个 data 来呃 crack 这些 problems。最重要就是我们有一个 graph， 就可以 show 我们整个 results。好，再次感谢何校长。